Um, right, well, as you've just heard, I'm David Tinker from Brands Eye. Um, and I'll start off by first of all telling you a little bit about what we, what we do. Um, we monitor online conversation on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, websites, blogs, etc., about brands, and then we derive insights from that data. So our clients would be people like APSA and the Carp Train and even ESCOM. Um, we process between one and three million tweets and other brand mentions a day. So it's not enormous volume, but it's not trivial either. Um, we do relevancy, sentiment analysis, we predict country, language, lots of other variables through machine learning algorithms and also using a cloud source system. Um, <clears throat> clients use our web application to see the, see the results and explore their data. That's how they, they interact with the data. I'll give you a quick, very simplified overview of the Brands Eye schema so you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about in the diagrams that follow. Um, essentially, we are lucky enough to be able to group our data by account. So each client has an account. And we basically keep track of a whole bunch of mentions, and each mention is linked to a number of search phrases, and those are linked to a brand. So that's essentially how we can bucket data and slice and dice it. I mean, obviously the actual schema is quite a bit more complex than this, but that gives you an overview sufficient for this presentation. In Brandsai in 2011, um, we had a single Java application, one EO file for everything. It did all the mention collecting, mention processing, the client web application, all accessing MySQL directly through Hibernate and JDBC. Um, we had a single MySQL server running at Rackspace with a, at least a separate database per client. So we had that bit of sharding already done. Um, and two application servers at Rackspace, each running exactly the same stack, but the processing side only running on one of them. And it was essentially just so uh, we could bounce the client app without clients noticing the app wasn't there. Um, this was an appropriate architecture in Brands I started back in 2006, but by this point we kind of outgrown that and we're struggling on a number of fronts. I mean, it got the product to market quickly and built Brands I into a profitable company. But at some point you need to change. Um, our major problems was the setup was very fragile. So any problem accessing MySQL or any part of the stack would stop mention collection and clients get very unhappy if there's a tweet about them and you don't get it. Uh, it's one of their primary points. Um, redeploying the application, for example, for a client web app change would in interrupt mention processing collection. It's hard to recover from processing failures because the mentions are not stored prior to being processed. They go straight in and if something happens, there's a bug, whatever, that data is now gone. Um, and any change to any part of the application risks breaking some other part of it. The usual sort of software engineering challenges you have with a monolithic application. Uh, and we didn't have any tests. Um, and it was also very difficult for us to change the MySQL schema or perhaps move to a different database because everything's all in one. So doing something like that was a, was a huge exercise and, and very risky. And of course, if our MySQL server dies, we are down for a while and we will definitely lose data because we won't be collecting it while this has happened. And the other problem was it was a bit slow because everything uses MySQL and our, our server was taking strain and we had um, poor latency. So it would take quite a while for a, a tweet, for example, or some other fairly live mention to show up in a client account. So we had to try and come up with a solution while keeping the business running, which is everybody's challenge when you go from just starting out to having to scale things. Um, <clears throat> we decided to separate out and decouple mention collection from processing and the client app and the database to separate them all out. So collection could continue while the rest of it was down and so on. Um, we only had a small team, about one and a half to four developers over that time frame. Um, yeah, I say, I say one and a half because Craig started Brandsai and he was still involved at that point doing some of the development. Um, so yeah, we also had, obviously had a limited budget like everybody, so we couldn't just write a whole bunch, whole new stuff on the side and then transition over it. We had to incrementally move things across. Um, and this is still in progress. So on the following slides, I'm going to describe what technologies we used, why we chose them, what's worked, and what hasn't worked. And these are all just the things that worked out for Brands Eye as our company operates, and the things that we found on the web, and it's possible we missed some things which could have helped. So I'm sure some of you will point that out. Um, <clears throat> this is a simplified overview of our new architecture. Um, as you can see on the, towards the top left, we have the feed proxy mention collector. There are actually a number of different pieces of software which collect mentions for us, depending on where we're getting them from, um, which feeds mentions via MQP into RabbitMQ, 
uh, set of RabbitMQ queues. Um, and these go to our pork, our mention processing pipeline to do all the processing. And that will send some of them off to other queues to go to our crowd, where our actual human raters will give input on sentiment and so on, things that are difficult to do with machine learning. Um, and pork mention processing pipeline finds out about all the brands and phases for all the accounts by talking to MASH. Um, and it stores mentions and retrieves mentions by talking to Chicken, which is our brand's our API and mention store. And all of this communication is done over HTTP, just sending JSON messages. Um, and then we also have our Beef, our client application, which is a, a JavaScript heavy a single page app running in the browser, which makes also calls back primarily to Mash and to Chicken. Um, and then third party APIs. That's those API calls that are Client users are all fully documented, and a brand's eye customer is free to write their own applications if they choose to do so and build their own dashboards on the data. And Chicken interacts with um, clusters using Postgres masters and slave configurations. So that's all completely hidden behind Chicken. So none of these other applications have any access to the mentioned data. That's a, a key thing we've changed. And you can see the naming convention is Sunday lunch, effectively. Apart from the feed proxy, which predates the choice of this convention, we have a large number of pieces of software named after things you can get at a Sunday lunch. So that's where pork, chicken, mash, crackling, all the rest of it come from. Okay, I'm just going to walk through the basic flow of how I mentioned gets into Brand's Eye and what happens to it, uh, so you can better understand the different pieces here. Um, okay, this is a tweet from earlier earlier in the week. Some of you talking about ScaleConf. I'm quite excited to be there. So they'll get picked up by one of our mentioned collectors. It'll go into RabbitMQ queue. It potentially may or may not go off to the Brand's Eye crowd where a starving student will rate it for us um, for some money. And it'll go back into pork into our mention processing pipeline, which will annotate it with lots of extra information, um, both automatically predicted and you know, from human raters in the crowd and whatnot. And then it'll store it in the client account through chicken. Um, that's it. So it's, it's, it's fairly simple, but there are a lot of different moving parts inside here, and it's a bit simplified. There are actually about, I think, 14 different services involved in, in all of this. <clears throat> okay, the first part I'm going to talk about is the actual mention collection side of things and what we use to implement that. Um, this is a Java application currently deployed on, on two virtual servers, um, the typical mention collector. It collects mentions from many different sources, and it uses Redis sorted sets for efficient polling and deduping of mentions. Um, it buffers mentions in a MongoDB cat collection as JSON messages, and then it copies them into a RabbitMQ queue on, on the remote server for processing. Um, we can replay mentions from a point in the past to recover from processing failures and, and other problems. And it has a simple web UI to, dis to display status and stats. <clears throat> Redis has worked um, very well for us in this application. It's a, it's a semi-persistent key value store, but it's not just simple values. You can have lists and sets and sorted sets and all sorts of nice operations on those. Um, it uses a clever trick of copy on write. So the way the persistence in Redis works, it actually forks the whole process and then starts writing the data out to a disk file. And it relies on the operating system's copy on write uh, semantics, not use too much memory while that's going on. Um, so. If your data fits in memory and you don't mind losing the last couple of minutes or so of data, um, Redis is great. It's lightning fast, uses hardly any CPU. Um, <clears throat> it's just about as easy as using in-memory data structures in a programming language like Java or Groovy or, or anything else. So it's basically great. Um, you do have to watch out for leaks, because when you restart your process, the leaks that were there are, are gone. But it's not so easy to clean up if you have leaks in Redis data structures. You have to write code to go find that stuff and clean it up. So you have to watch out a bit for that, that it doesn't start growing. Um, they don't have a cluster version yet, but you can do um, replication. <clears throat> MongoDB was a bit more of a mixed bag for us. MongoDB is a JSON data store of indexing, querying, and so on. Um, <clears throat> it uses memory map files for everything and relies on the operating system to bring stuff in as needed. Um, the feature that appealed to us was, first of all, we already had JSON messages. So here's a database specialized for storing JSON messages. And it has capped collections, so you can specify a collection of a fixed size, and it acts as a ring buffer. So it sounds like a perfect fit if you need to store a whole bunch of messages um, and be able to replay them in the past. But the problem with capped collections, they actually get quite slow when they get full, even if you only have one index. Um, it still slows down quite a lot. As soon as the collection gets full, the I.O. shoots up a lot on, on the machine. 
which is you know not so great. And Mongo gets kind of swapped out. So if you only occasionally retrieve old stuff, it takes a hell of a long time to do it because all the indexes and everything all have to be loaded in, and it's quite slow. So you probably, if you want to get performance out of it, you probably want to run it on a machine which doesn't do anything else, which wasn't our use case. We just wanted a ring buffer for storing JSON messages. Um, so it's, it's quite an expensive way of buffering our, our mentions. So we're, we've actually written a replacement. We don't have it in production yet, a much simpler disk-based ring buffer concept that will do what we need it to do. Okay, RabbitMQ is a message broker. You set up exchanges and queues, and you can specify routing rules to intelligently route messages into queues, depending on what's in, in kind of like a routing queue or a header. Um, <clears throat> and you have consumers, which basically get messages delivered to them from the queues whenever messages are available. So it, it's quite, quite, a, quite simple, and it allows you to decouple processes quite nicely. So we have these mention collectors, which are buffering mentions themselves, but only if they can't reach the rabbit service. Um, and then they feed them into rabbit, and they don't really have to worry about it after that. Um, and then our processor just or processors can just read mentions from the queues and process them. So it's all quite simple. Um, we initially used RabbitMQ running on each collector machine and shoveling. They have a tool called a shovel, which will move messages from one Rabbit instance to another Rabbit instance. But we found you know, every couple of weeks, the shovel would just inexplicably get stuck with no arrowing or anything. It just wasn't moving any messages anymore, um, which wasn't great. Um, Obviously, we could write our own code to take messages out of one queue and write them to another queue on another machine, which is what we considered doing. Um, but it was easier rather just to, because we didn't need all the rabbit um, brokering and all that on the collecting machines. We just wanted to be, re be able to store messages and replay them. So that's uh, we eventually scratched that part of it. Um, the other issue of rabbit is the memory usage climbs more or less linearly with the number of messages in all of your queues. So if you're consuming your messages quickly, that's great. But if for some reason your processing code goes down and you've got messages coming in at a rapid rate, the memory usage climbs very quickly. And you can specify a high watermark of memory usage. And when it gets to that, it stops accepting more messages, which is not necessarily what you want. You just have to be aware that that's what will happen when it gets busy and your processes are not running. And you can't replay messages from a point in time in the past. But right, now I'm going to talk about the chicken, the next part of the process, um, uh, circled in blue there, the chicken mention store um, and our public API. <clears throat> chicken provides a REST API to access mention data and analytics. So the raw data of mentions, raw tweets, and Google Plus mentions or whatever, Facebook stuff, websites. Um, but it also provides a lot of analytics. So you can ask for like a, a histogram of volume over the past two weeks, group by day and it'll give you back those counts with whatever filters. Um, it's written using Grails, which is a Groovy and Java Ruby on Rails clone, essentially, but it runs on top of the whole Spring stack, so it gives you that sort of Rails level of productivity, but not leaving the Java ecosystem, which is what we wanted it for. Um, it's the only app with direct access to the mentioned databases, the per account mentioned databases, and it translates our high-level filter language into SQL. Um, so we have a, you can specify in, in almost English filter language which mentions you're looking for, and this will generate SQL queries to return that data. Um, it has a, a good set of functional tests, which is obviously you know, essential for this part of our infrastructure at least, because if somebody breaks something here, everything goes down. Um, <clears throat> brands our customers can use this API to build their own dashboards. Uh, it supports multiple different mention stores of a single API, so we, we're busy transitioning from MySQL to Postgres, and we can actually do that in parallel. We don't have to switch everything over. We can just have some accounts running on it and test out and see how well it behaves. Um, it keeps stats in Redis. It uses Apache Solar for full text search, but we're probably going to go use the stuff Postgres has for that, just to have all the data in one place. Um, and it's stateless, so if necessary in future, we can run more of these very easily. The, currently the limiting factor of the database service, so that's not necessary at the moment. Chicken has very good online documentation called the, the Book of Chicken. So if you actually go to api.brandsi.com and you authenticate, you, the documentation for the API is all there with examples and everything. And we, we, we make quite an effort to keep that up to date. Um, you know, this is it's used by clients, so obviously from that point of view we need to do it, but even just internally, even just with a team of four, you know, if you don't start documenting this sort of stuff, everything becomes you know, smoke and mirrors and people break things. 
Um, we use semantic versioning, so we increment the major version number on breaking a API changes, which they actually haven't been so far, so it's still on version one. Uh, minor, we increment when we add new functionality, and then the patch level for bug fixes. You see there's a typical URL to get some data out of chicken. Um, okay, we just use HTTPS with basic authentication. Um, there's no HTTP access, so it's not too bad. Um, so that'll get, for, all, for the BESC 27AA account, which is the scale conf account, all the mentions published in the last month that weren't in English. And I think there are probably about two of them, and that's where the language classifier has got it wrong, actually, because everybody tweets about this conference in English. Um, and that will be translated into SQL. I mean, this is obviously not the real SQL, because the scheme is a bit more complicated than that. But this is essentially the job Chicken does for us. And if you compare those two, if you had an application, you can build these sort of layers within an application, have a service layer, and make sure all the queries are only there, but it always leaks. There's always something that ends up in a controller somewhere. If you actually build it as a separate service that takes you know, URLs in and JSON comes out, you don't get to leak anything. And it's all a whole lot more testable, and the code base is smaller. That's why we've gone with this sort of architecture. So Chicken's job is to do this. That's all it does. It has a very simple console and a good set of tests, so we can actually keep it running reliably. <clears throat> now, you may ask, why are we moving to Postgres from uh, MySQL, especially in light of yesterday's talk, where somebody was doing the exact reverse. Um, the main thing is synchronous replication. Uh, one of the issues we have now with our MySQL setup is if, if we lose the server, we've got to restore backups from yesterday and process a hell of a lot of messages, and we will lose some data. Um, synchronous replication allows you to keep a pair of servers exactly in sync because it works at the database log record level. So when a transaction commits on the master, it's not considered committed until the log records have gone across to the slave, and the slaves actually acknowledge that. Um, so you can keep everything very, very closely in sync. And you know, just reading the documentation for this stuff, I thought oh, this will actually work. Whereas reading the MySQL documentation, it just sounded pretty iffy. Um, I think they've improved it, but it just doesn't sound like something that's going to work reliably to me. So um, we actually tried tr tr this out, and we got the master slave working. We wrote a little piece of software to monitor the two machines so I can tell if one of them goes down and either cut off replication because the slave's dead or promote the slave to be the new master. And it all happens quite seamlessly. Um, <clears throat> other reasons, Postgres has uh, good full text search and arrays, which are useful to us because we've had to denormalize quite a few of our sort of join tables to roll it into phrase one through eight on, on, the, on the main table, just for performance reasons. Um, the MySQL query planner doesn't handle some simple subqueries properly, and it's, it's considered a bug in MySQL, but it's been like that for five years, 10 years. So it's, it's probably not going to get fixed anytime soon. Um, and it also inexplicably fails to use indexes for some queries where, you know, my background in the past is Sybase, where I know it would never get this sort of thing wrong. Um, so that's not great. So suddenly a query takes 30 seconds to run instead of 500 milliseconds that has a, an impact on your stuff. Um, you might wonder why we use, we're using a relational database because we have quite a lot of volume of data. We need to be able to add our queries. We capture a lot of different attributes about mentions and we, we can't predict why, how a client is going to want to slice and dice the data. Um, and um, relational databases are really good at that as long as you can get the performance out of it. And if some query becomes popular, it's very easy for us to add index on that column and then it goes faster. <clears throat> why Grails? Um, it's quick to build apps with Grails. Um, it, the syntax is very similar to Ruby and Python, but it runs on the VM and it integrates completely seamlessly with Java code. That's Groovy syntax. And most Java code is also valid Groovy, uh, Groovy code, which is great for a team with a Java background and an existing Java code base. Um, Grails is very much like Rails, but using familiar stuff, Spring, Hibernate, etc. And before we went down this route, I actually I wrote an application using Rails and it was pretty good, it was quick and worked nicely, but I missed a lot of things from the Java side of stuff, and I found the documentation the libraries wasn't quite up to what I was used to. Um, so there were lots of good points and lots of bad points. Um, Grails is a little bit more complicated than Rails, but if you already know the Java stack, that's not a problem for you. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a good fit for us. And there are loads of plugins, and it's very easy to write them to tackle whatever tasks you might have. And performance is available. So most of our stuff is written in just straight Groovy code with Grails, but there are a few bits and pieces. For example, when a mention comes in, we've got to look at all the search phrases we have across all the accounts, like 
uh, more than 10,000 of them and figure out exactly which accounts might be interested in this little bit of data. And that little bit of code is written in Java. And it's easy enough to do, and it's a small percentage of the code base. It goes fast. And we won't have to switch stacks, for example, from Ruby to Java at some point for performance reasons. We've got a stack which can scale for us. Okay, the next part of the puzzle is uh, MASH, our store for account metadata. So that's all the brands and phrases and other information about an account, but not the mentioned data itself, all the big volume stuff. Um, it as well provides a REST API. Um, it's a Grails app using MySQL, though we'll probably move it to Postgres at some point. Um, it has all the brands, phrases, processing rules. And what's interesting here is it notifies clients of changes to this data via RabbitMQ topic exchange. So anybody can say they're interested in client metadata about brands and phrases, and if somebody makes a change to any of that, they get a notification. Um, and our clients cache this data, so they'll make a HTTP call to MASH to go fetch it, and then they'll cache it until they get a notification that it's changed or a timeout expires. So we've written a little library, which most of our applications use, which handles all of this caching and gives you a little data model of everything in there, uh, mapped from the JSON that MASH sends back. Um, and it's a very simple way to distribute this information across all of our apps. Um, it works, works quite nicely for us. Okay, the next part is PORC, our mentioned processing pipeline. Okay, PORC consumes mentions, JSON messages essentially from RabbitMQ queues. Um, again, it's a Grails app with a very simple UI just for monitoring. Um, it annotates mentions of extra information, relevancy, sentiment, country, language using machine learning techniques. Um, it applies automatic processing rules. It sends and receives mentions from the brands like Crowd via RabbitMQ. Um, it writes mentions to Chicken. And it either acts the mention if everything's good or knacks it if, if um, it needs to reprocess it. For example, you might be trying to look up information from Twitter API about a user and Twitter's down at that point. In that case, that mention will just be knacked. It'll go back in the queue after, say, a 30 second delay and then it will be retried. So it makes it um, highly resilient to failures and third party services. Or if chicken's down, for example, somebody's restarting chicken, um, pork will just knack a whole bunch of mentions, there'll be a whole bunch of errors in the logs. As soon as chicken comes up, all those will be reprocessed and it's all happy and you haven't actually lost anything. <clears throat> it has a lot of batching and sharing of models for performance and rate limiting reasons. So it's not a, uh, each mention comes in and has no knowledge of any other mention being processed type architecture. Uh, the mentions are grouped into batches and there's, there's a lot of shared state between the different batches and the different threads processing all of this stuff, um, mostly for performance reasons. Um, you know, when you call like the Twitter API, you'll get so many calls you can make per hour. Um, so if you can look up 100 users at a time, that's what you should be doing, not one at a time, or you'll hit the rate limits very quickly. And even something simple, like one of the first things that happens to a mention is we, when we figure out an account is interested in, in data, we need to collect up, we need to look and see if that account already has that mention or not, because we get a lot of duplicate data so those will group up to about 100 mentions for one account and we can then make a single call to chicken and a single database query to check to see whether this mention already, any of these mentions already exist. So it's for that reason. Um, groovy closures and other features that result in, in quite compact maintainable code, especially closures um, compared to say writing uh, straight driver code of lots of anonymous classes or whatever. Um, and that part works pretty well. Um, it can process a million plus mentions an hour, but the limiting factor is chicken and the database service, not so much pork. And again, it keeps stats in Redis. Uh, RabbitMQ, in, in this model, what's very good about it is the whole ACNAC model is great for development. Uh, you can write very simple code. If, if any of you just need an outermost exception trap for whatever you're doing, and if something goes wrong, you knack the mention. If you get right to the end and nothing's gone wrong, you act it. It's great, and you can bounce the server whenever you want, and all the unact messages end up back in the queue. Um, it's very easy to duplicate messages on the fly, so if you're working on brand's eye and you're trying to debug a problem, you can get a fee, you can very easily siphon off real incoming mentions into a little queue of your own, and go look at them or process them. Uh, limitations, you, uh, and it has a nice admin console. Um, you cannot cluster queues, so even for clustered rabbit, losing a machine means you lose everything on in those queues. You can cluster the queue definitions, but not the data itself. It only goes onto one machine. So you must be prepared that you might lose everything on that machine. So you really need to store your mentions somewhere else. 
as a backup, which is essentially what we do. And as I mentioned before, the memory usage climbs rapidly if you're not consuming messages. Okay, our client web application. This is a, a Grails and JavaScript app using Backbone and Handlebars and Marionettes and a whole bunch of other JavaScript libraries. Um, the Grails site is very thin, obviously, because it's a JavaScript application. Um, <clears throat> it communicates with Chicken using the same API we offer to our clients. Um, and also communicates with MASH to maintain brand and, and phrase data. And these calls are all done using um, calls for cross-site cross -site requests. We've enabled that on their servers. So the calls go directly. There are very few where it goes back to its own server. Um, it's all REST using JSON. Um, and it makes it, because of all the communications over properly done services that have tests and things, and we can refactor those things and we can change schemas and things without having to worry about breaking all of the stuff, so long as the tests are kept up to date. For monitoring, we use Wormly to basically check if things are up and if machines are running out of space and that sort of thing. Um, every app has a, a simple web console, which the basic rule is if there's something seriously wrong, it must write error somewhere on that console. So we can easily configure the monitoring service to look for the string error in the response. And if it's there, there's a problem. And we aggregate logs using uh, Greylog2. So, I mean, this is a part of a screenshot from the Greylog2 console showing all the different streams of logs we have. And those little lines, all the flat lines are good, because that means there are no log messages in the last five minutes. And we only log log messages if something's going wrong, generally. Um, you can see there's a little log with a little spike for gravy and a couple of little spikes for pork. So there's something not quite right there, but if there was something badly wrong, there'd be a big fat line, and there would be hundreds, hundreds of messages a second, and you can do something about it. So you know, this one page pretty much tells us that most of our stuff is working well. That's just a shot of the um, little UI console for pork. I mean, we build all these things using Twitter Bootstrap, like pretty much everybody else does these days. Um, I mean, it just has a whole bunch of little checkboxes, so we can turn on debug logging for different parts of it. So if you're trying to diagnose a problem, you don't have to restart the server to turn on quite finely detailed logging for that part of the system. Um, and pork itself, you know, to keep the processing server small and focused on that goal, this is the extent of its console. There's a, a much more comprehensive console of lots of graphs and things that are pulled from Redis called um, Crackling. Uh, again, written as a separate piece of software, so there's less risk of somebody fiddling with the graphing stuff, which is not that important, breaking dimension processing, which is important. <clears throat> on the uh, source code control and so on, um, we use Git and Bitbucket. Um, Bitbucket is essentially the same as GitHub, but if you have a small team with a large number of repositories, it's a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, we don't use branch as much. We try and make sure that master is always deployable. So preferably don't deploy anything that's going to break master. And at the very least, make sure the tests are working. If you're going to do something that's going to take quite a few days and you want to do multiple commits, then do that on a branch, then you must merge it in. But um, don't put bad stuff on master is the, the basic rule. Um, our applications are packaged as executable wall files. So the server container is embedded in the wall. So you can just do java minus jar cracking dot wall and it will come up listening on a port and you can go hit that and see it's working. Um, most of them are actually built on the target machines. We don't have any continuous integration in place yet. That's one of those things that, yeah, I, I knew we needed it two years ago, but we just haven't had time and so far things are still working so we haven't built it yet. Um, we don't deploy, we don't build these wall files on developer machines at least. We actually build them on the servers they deployed on so at least the environment is controlled. Um, we use Apache or Nginx in, in front of these. Um, each app has, a, has at least a readme.md um, describing its purpose, how to build it, its dependencies, how to get it running on your machine. So if somebody needs to work on service X, Y, Z, they can just go to the repository and there should be enough information there for them to get it up and running on their machine without having to ask everybody on the team, how, how do I run this, how do I test it? Um, we try and keep to that level of documentation at least, because even on a, on a small team when you have about 40 repositories of different little things, you forget how things work and you know, having a, lots of services means to run one thing you need a whole bunch of other things as well, which can be a real pain if it's actually difficult to get those things working. <clears throat> we use Hetzner and um, Amazon Web Services and we are currently moving away from Rackspace primarily for um, price reasons. Um, Hetzner is dramatically cheaper for what are probably inferior machines, but if you're only paying one-sixth of the price, you can have more of them and engineer your stuff. So if one of those white box boxes breaks, your stuff still runs. Um, that's where we're going with that. 
Um, and we've also found the rack space cloud space is, uh, cloud servers are way more expensive than Amazon servers, and they charge you even if you're not running the things, which is not great for development boxes when you find this out a few months down the line. Um, so we're moving towards a few machi um, more machines that can fail instead of a few reliable machines, even though we could run all of the stuff on just a couple of servers. Um, other factors, here's going to give you failover IPs that you can change of an API. So you can have several different machines all sharing the same IP address, and at hits on the hardware level, you can decide which machine actually gets the traffic. So that lets you basically cut machines off from the network. Um, so you don't have this problem of a dead machine coming back to life when you've just broken the replication or whatever. Um, traffic is free, up to 10,000 gigs a month. I think that's it per server, uh, you know, which is you know, great for backups in our case. Um, and we need physical hardware for at least a database service to get the performance out of it. So we don't want to run that stuff on um, cloud servers. Let's have a quick summary of the technology we've used and how it's worked out for us. Um, Redis is a very fast, solid piece of software. We've had very few problems with it. Um, and if you can fit your data in memory, like the typical thing you would keep in process in an application, you can shift them off into Redis. And now you'll have the added benefit that you can bounce your app without losing all of that data. Um, you just have to watch out for leaks in those data structures. Uh, MongoDB cap collections are slower than you expect, and it really wants to be the only thing installed on your server, which is not, uh, not so great for us. Um, MySQL, not so good at optimizing queries or using indexes, dodgy replication. I, I must admit I haven't actually tried to get the replication to work, but reading how it worked, I, I wasn't impressed, so I, I decided not to try that. Um, Postgres synchronous replication is cool, and it's got advanced query optimizer. RabbitMQ, great for short-term routing your messages, but you have to watch out for memory usage if you're not actually processing those messages. So in, in conclusion, we're now at a point where we can easily scale brains out handle pretty much any number of clients and volume dimensions. We can add more chickens and more porks and more database server clusters as, as necessary. Um, all of this is still in progress because uh, we've got to keep everything running while we're busy. Um, we have a whole lot of other little apps not described here, all interacting using the same tech. So, you know, it's, it's very nice to, if you want to do something, build it as a separate service, it's its own little application, its own code base. If it's not that important, you can have more junior people on the team working on it without having to worry about them breaking all sorts of important stuff. You can give people responsibility for applications, you know, even at a fairly junior level, like this is yours to look after to keep it running and to deploy it and everything else. Um, and we've done a lot of work with Chef and so on for our new service, but it's not handling everything yet. And um, that's still up in the air because uh, we did all that, left it for two months, and then ran the Chef scripts and they all fell over uh, after only two months of inactivity. So we've got a bit of work to do there. Um, we're offering a $100 discount for Brands Eye to anybody who actually wants to try it out for people who are at ScaleConf over the next month or so. So if you do want to try Brands Eye for your organization, just get hold of our sales team. But otherwise, any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, your names are cute, but don't new people wonder what the hell the difference between pork and beef and potatoes are? Yeah, no, 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 they will. That's why we have the readme files in the repositories. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, first, the first paragraph is to describe what does this piece of software do, and what's its purpose. Uh, can you describe how you went from a monolithic app to breaking up into bits? So, I mean, presumably, you're trying to keep everything running while you're doing breaking yeah. up. So. Well, the first thing we did was um, separate out the mention collection part because that was our, our biggest pain point. Um, you know, it's all right to not process mentions for a while, but if you're not collecting them for a lot of the feeds we get, you actually lose data and you can't get it back. So that's why that piece of software is called Feed Proxy because initially, instead of the processing thing querying services directly on the internet, it would query the feed proxy, which already had the data it had collected. And then we moved from that to using RabbitMQ and having the whole um, new pork processing pipeline. So first mention collection, then it was the processing pipeline. Then we moved all the database access code out of the processing pipeline and the application into chicken. So we built chicken and refactored the processing pipeline to talk to chicken. Then we extracted out MASH, so all the metadata wasn't living in the individual accounts. It was centralized and also had an API. And now finally we've replaced the client web application with uh, the new JavaScript heavy one using uh, web services to talk back to our stuff. So that's more or less the order that we did it. 
so we could keep everything running while we were busy with it. So um, you've got this uh, architecture with queues in between all your components, but can you explain to us a little bit about any single point of failure amongst those components? Are any of them reliant on a single server or a single instance that can't be sort of scaled horizontally for uh, that component? Yeah, currently RabbitMQ is one of those because um, all the data is just on the one machine. So if you lose it, you'll lose everything in those queues. Um, Redis as well. We haven't tried clustering Redis at all. So some of the things that use Redis quite a lot, um, that would be a problem. But we can run more than one chicken. We can run more than one mash. We can run more than one pork without too much trouble. We can run multiple instances of the application which serves up the client application. Um, so we've more or less got that right. Um, with the Postgres clusters, you know, if we lose a database server, we'll be OK. And we can have as many clusters as we like because the accounts are sharded across the clusters. So we can handle the volume there. But yeah, currently in our actual physical deployed infrastructure, we have a number of single points of failure because we haven't put all this in place yet. Um, but we're at least in a position where we could get a new server up fairly quickly and put the right stuff on it. Hi. Um, you mentioned your clients having to connect to RamonQ and consume for your API. Um, do, do they con connect directly and actually subscribe to a queue, or do you have some kind of interface for that? No, no, sorry. I, um, the only thing which consumes those mentions actually is pork. Our clients talk to data that's already in the database served up by chicken. They don't interact directly with the, with the queues. When I said uh, client there, um, I was probably talking about our actual service applications within Brands Eye, and they listened on the topic exchanges to tell when um, client account meter data has changed, brands and phrases and things. Yeah. You talk a bit about your client base. Do you sell exclusively in South Africa or have you got international clients? No, we, we do have some international clients, but most of our clients are South African currently. Um, you know, online reputation monitoring, what we do is a very localized service. So, you know, we compete with big international companies, but in the South African market, we, we beat them out because you need to know the local market and brands and all that. But we, we do have plans to move internationally. Hi, um, I just have a couple of questions around your crowdsourcing. Um, I'd like to know like, um, how, how many raters do you have? Um, how do you choose and grow those raters? And how do you rate your raters? Because how do you know that the mentions that they are actually putting and they're rating those mentions are actually valid and correct? Uh, that's actually a very difficult, difficult problem we've been fighting with for a while. Um, we have probably about 30 raters. Um, and the, if we bring on, we could bring on more, but then they get unhappy because they don't have any work to do and they can't earn money. Um, so we actually, at the moment, we actually have enough for the volume we're feeding through the crowd. But um, mentions are rated by more than one person, and we compare the results. And if they don't add up on, on different attributes, we send it to a third person as sort of a tiebreaker. Um, but we've actually found that's not enough because people will tend to picking the easiest answers, and they know everybody else is going to do that, and things rapidly go south. So what we do, we actually have um, brands eye staff sort of seeding the system by you know, there's an appeals process where if somebody feels hard done by about a result, they can appeal a mention. And then somebody within Brand's eye who's not motivated by time or money to do the job, they, they need to get it right or rate the mention themselves. And that sort of seeds the system with known good data. And then one of the things we do is every now and then we feed a rater a known mention where we know what the answers are because it's been done by somebody within Brand's eye. And um, if they get that wrong, the accuracy goes down and, and the payout per mention um, scales up exponentially of how accurate you are. So there's a strong incentive to be at least 90% accurate. But yeah, it's an ongoing challenge and it requires, you know, it's not entirely scalable as we add more raters. We're going to have to add more people judging the mentions and feeding in the good data. Now, I just want to say one thing about that. I mean, what the crowd really does for us is give us a lot of human verified data for the machine learning algorithms. Otherwise, it's difficult to get that. Um, it's a very valuable for us on, on that basis. Uh, hey, David, I just wanted to ask what's your opinion on uh, Node.js? <laughs> um, yeah, OK, well, Ben, that's a bit of a, a loaded question. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> look, I mean, uh, we've just written a big JavaScript application, and um, I think the JavaScript code should stay there in the browser. I, I, should, I can't understand why people want to use this stuff on the server. <laughs> 
It's, I mean, maybe I'm too much of a Java guy, but it's just a, it's a horrible language. You've got so many other choices. Why JavaScript? <laughs> 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 <laughs>